So, hello and very welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ilinka Benson, I am Deputy CEO here at SNS and I will uh, moderate this uh, seminar. The expression war for talent uh, was coined some 25 years ago when I was uh, fresh on the labour market and refers to the increasing competition regarding recruiting and uh, retaining talented employees. It is highly relevant description of the situation facing employers as today as well. According to a survey conducted last year, uh, the three out of four Swedish employers state that they are having trouble finding people with the right skills. And uh, on a global level, two thirds of the employers say that they suffer from skill shortages, which is the highest number since this survey started in 2006. So, how do employers go about to, uh, about to identify, nurture and promote talent within their organizations? And are they exploiting their entire talent pool? Since you already know the topic of today's seminar, you may find these questions overly rhetorical. It is clear already from our invitation that the study Danielle Lee will soon present finds that there is room for improvement to say the least, when it comes to assess and assessing women's talents within organizations. I find this study truly thought-provoking and also truly provoking. Uh, so I'm delighted that we will soon have the opportunity to listen to Danielle Lee talk about it here in person. And we have this opportunity thanks to Sophie, uh, the Swedish, you're not Sophie, but you represent Sophie, the Swedish Institute for Social Research at Stockholm University, uh, whose researchers have invited Daniel Lee to Stockholm. Very welcome here. I'm also very happy that we have such a fine panel here uh, that will be able to relate Lee's um, findings to the Swedish context and share their views on the causes behind uh, these findings, as well as their suggestions to what can be done to change these patterns. And I hope and expect that all of you who are here today, both in the room and also uh, participating online, will join our discussion uh, with your questions and also by sharing your experiences about these matters. If you're here, simply raise your hand and wait for a microphone uh, during the panel session. And if you participate online, you may simply write your question or comments directly in the Q&A uh, window that is somewhere on your screen. And then my colleague Daniel will, uh, will read them up to us here in the room um, at appropriate occasions during uh, the session. Before we start, I would also like to, to mention that this seminar is part of our new seminar series, Gender Equality in the 2020s, which is a collaboration with the, the, both, uh, the before mentioned um, institute, Sophie, at the university. And um, if you have ideas for topics that you think that we should raise in this uh, seminar series, which will go in on for another three years, please let us know. I mean, tell me, tell Louis-Pierre, tell Daniel or anyone else here at SNS, and we will try to accommodate those wishes. Because, of course, it's, in, it's very important that the things that we bring up here is of relevance to you. Uh, Yes. So now I would like to, to welcome you, Danielle Lee, up on the stage. So Danielle is the class of 1922 career development professor and an associate professor at MIT Sloan School of Management, as well as a faculty research fellow at the National New, uh, Bureau of Economic Research. Her research interests in, are uh, in economics of innovation and labor economics, and you have a focus on how organizations evaluate ideas, projects and people that we will talk about today. And uh, Danielle's work has been published in the leading academic journals across a range of different fields, including the Quarterly Journal of Economics, Science and Management Science. And in addition, your work has also been regularly featured in media outlets such as The Economist, New York Times and Wall Street Journal. We're very happy to have you here. Please. work and to, uh, to get your feedback and, and thoughts. Okay, so um, I, uh, before I talk about the specific paper, I thought I would give kind of a general introduction to how I think about this, which is why we have a different title for the talk, How Can Organizations Build Better Imaginations? So I think that one of the, the things that's really important is that if you think about any firm, any organization, in order for them to be successful, what they need to do is they need to 
effectively evaluate people and ideas. So those are the two key assets that, that companies have. And so we should think about uh, in terms of research or in terms of project development, which projects should we prioritize and develop. And at the same time, we have to think about the people who are going to bring their talents to developing those ideas. So what people can best, um, best develop ideas. And actually, before we think about sort of the technical aspects of it, that's um, investing in both people and in projects is something that requires a lot of imagination. Because what you're trying to do, imagine thinking about people, is you're trying to think about for any given person, how well would they do if they were given an opportunity that they don't currently have? So this isn't information that we necessarily see immediately. We're trying to sort of imagine a counterfactual world in which someone gets to do something they haven't had the chance to do. And if we, so a lot of my research is about how organizations try to improve their imaginations. And we live in a world now that's incredibly data rich. So firms have access to lots of information. So there's, um, if you're thinking about projects, you have information on how consumers are clicking. You have people's social media accounts. You have their education. You have your own experience. You have the advice from others. And so a lot of my work is about understanding how organizations try to manage all this information in order to make better inferences, in order to be better at imagining things, and then how do they then make better decisions. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to talk about this question in the context of making promotion decisions. So who gets to be the boss? Who gets to move up from their current rank? Um, how well do we evaluate people's potential to lead? And what kinds of mistakes do we make? And how what might we do better? So this is uh, joint work with my co-authors, uh, Alan Benson and Kelly Shu, and it's called Promotions and the Gender, uh, Gender Promotion Gap. Okay. So there's this question about who we should promote. And you're trying to imagine how well someone would do if they were given this opportunity. So one very natural thing to consider is let's use the evidence that we have about someone's demonstrated potential. And the benefit of that approach is that it's based on something real, something that actually happened. So you can look to see how well someone performed in their current job. Did they meet their performance um, targets, for instance? But the problem with that approach, or using solely that approach, is that this new job you're considering promoting them to, that could require a different skill set. And so there's a thing called the Peter Principle, which is that if you promote people based on um, whether they're good at their current jobs, you're going to keep promoting them if they're good at their current jobs. And then the moment they stop being good at their current jobs, you're not going to promote them anymore. So you're basically promoting people into their level of incompetence. And that happens because there's a mismatch between what, people, what skills are for one job and the skills for another job. And so you don't necessarily want to rely entirely on performance in the existing job to make these kinds of promotion decisions. And so companies know this, and a common solution that they use now is to try to directly assess a worker's potential. And that's nice because it recognizes that people can grow, that people can change. It recognizes that the new managerial role might require a different skill set. But the concern here is that potential now is fundamentally this imagined thing that's sort of divorced from what we actually get to observe. And that allows it to be much more subjective. And so we start from the paper in the sense that there's a lot of research that shows that these subjective forecasts could disproportionately hurt the careers of women. And there are a few reasons for this. So one broad class of reasons is known as role congruity theory. And the idea here is that when we're trying to make complex decisions and we don't have all the information, it's very easy to sort of rely on stereotypes to try to pattern match. So if you're trying to figure out who would make a good leader, you would think about the stereotypes that we typically associate with good leaders. So whether someone is results oriented or competitive or ambitious. And then you would think about the people you're considering and think about the stereotypes you associate with them. And the concern here is that the oftentimes the stereotypes that we associate with good leaders are not the stereotypes that we associate with women. And there could be a lot of reasons why that's the case, but one very simple reason is that women are underrepresented in management and leadership roles. And so when we sort of imagine a manager, we're typically imagining a man. Now, a second potential concern is that subjective forecasts, so subjective evaluations of someone's quality, someone's potential, because it's so subjective, it's potentially more subject to favoritism or various kinds of politics. And so if I like you, I can just say that you're good. And because quality isn't defined very specifically, I can get away with that. Now that in itself is very gender neutral. 
but there's a large amount of research showing that women might have less inclination to sort of engage in networking and various kinds of kind of sucking up. Um, they might have less access to those resources. You might not be invited to, um, to the bar after work because you have to go home and take care of your children, and that's where a lot of these relationships are built. You might have lower returns to networking, so that even if you are invited, you're seen as pushy if you try to form those relationships, whereas a man might, be, um, might not sort of get that same impression. And so as a result of that, these, um, this puts women at a disadvantage in trying to get managers to give them these higher subjective evaluations. So we're going to study how much this matters. And so we're going to look at this in the context of evaluations of performance and potential and how they relate to promotions decisions um, at an anonymous firm that provided some data for us. So the, um, the firm is a large North American retail chain. It actually employs over a million workers, so at the cashier kind of entry level. But we're going to focus on the people who are sort of salaried white collar workers who are in management track positions within this, um, within this firm. So that's about 30,000 people. <coughs> and so our firm is like many firms in that it evaluates their workers on two dimensions. So one is a measure of their performance, which is a backward-looking measure of how well they actually did in their jobs. And another is a forward-looking measure of what you think that person's potential is. So the system this firm uses is called a nine-box grid because it ranks performance as a one, two, three, it ranks potential as a one, two, three, and that multiplies into a nine by nine, uh, three by three, nine box matrix. Um, different companies use different versions of this, and it's quite popular uh, in HR. So other firms that use this, JP Morgan, Accenture, Bristol Myers in pharmaceuticals, uh, in tech, in consumer goods. And so these nine box ratings are important because they're used to allocate promotions, they're used to allocate bonuses and training opportunities, which can determine people's future skills. And what's nice in this setting is that because we have, oftentimes we're always evaluating each other's potential. When you think about um, who to hire, what students to mentor, you're thinking about this. But very rarely do researchers actually get to observe people's assessments <coughs> of other people's potential. And because we have these potential scores, we get to sort of look into what the firm is thinking about when they're making these evaluations of people. Okay. So um, let me um, sort of s preview the results, and I'll kind of go through them in a bit more detail in the subsequent slides. So the headline result, basically, is that potential ratings, assessments of potential matter, and they tend to hold women back in their careers. So the first thing is that women receive lower ratings of their potential despite receiving higher ratings of their actual performance on the job. And this gap in potential ratings is important in that it seems to explain a large part of the gender promotion gap that we actually observe in our data as well. Now, one possibility is that women receive lower potential ratings because they actually have lower potential in some way. So we try to measure this and we try to assess this. And what we're going to show you is that there's some evidence that that's not what's happening. Instead, it seems like these potential ratings are biased in the sense that you want a potential rating to be an accurate assessment of someone's future performance on the job. So we can look at people's future performance, and what we find is that both when promoted and actually when they're not promoted, women tend to have higher what we call realized potentials. They have higher future performance compared to men who receive the same potential rating today. And lastly, what seems to happen is that firms appear to reward the threat of leaving with higher potential ratings. So there's sort of two aspects of your ability to contribute to a firm. So it's how well you're going to perform in the future, and there's the likelihood that you actually stay at the job and continue sort of working in the same company. And typically, we think of the desire to stay at the firm as maybe a good thing, because it means that you're going to have a longer tenure with the firm, you're going to have more opportunities to contribute to the firm. And so you might want to reward that kind of loyalty. But actually what happens instead is that men are more likely to quit. And in particular, men are more likely to quit when they're passed over for promotions. And because of that, firms actually direct resources trying to retain men. So they're more likely to assess men as at high risk of loss. And people who are assessed to be at high risk of loss get resources directed to them. So they're more likely to be promoted, they get higher bonuses, they get um, increased, um, increased pay. And so what ends up happening is that because women are in some sense more loyal to the company, they're less likely to leave, especially when they're not treated as well. Uh, what firms do is they, they don't put as many resources into women. That's bad for women, but it's also bad for the firm because what happens is that now the firm is promoting a man who actually statistically will perform less well in the future 
relative to a woman um, who is not sort of as much risk of leaving. Okay, so let me kind of uh, walk you through how some of these results get there. So this is a uh, nine box grid. You can kind of Google it. It's a pretty common um, HR tool. And so you can sort of see people ranked in terms of potential and ranked in terms of performance. So if you have high performance but low potential, you're thought of as a workhorse. If you have uh, low performance and high potential, you're thought of as a diamond in the rough or something like that. Okay. So um, nine box is a very, very common tool. I'm not sure how many of you have, uh, have heard about it, but it's, it's tools like this are fairly ubiquitous. And so you can Google things. And th you know, they say that this is the management science equivalent of free software. It's free. It's like Angry Birds. It's like Fruit Ninja. Um, but it provides a, a forming and the foundations of succession planning. So the key here is that even though it's kind of this like, simple thing, it actually really is used in terms of how the firm directs resources. OK. So let me sort of tell you a little bit about the firm. So our firm is like many firms in the world where women's representation shrinks as we move up the career ladder. So if we focus on the uh, left panel here, this is the, um, the career ladder within the retail store. So there's about 4,000 retail locations. And here we have a pretty clear picture of what a hierarchy looks like. So what we see is that among entry-level workers, so these are people like cashiers or people who work in the stock room, about 56% of workers at the entry level are women. When we move to department managers, that falls to 48%. When we get up to store managers, that's 35%. When we move up to the district manager level, that becomes 14%. Now, if we look at the, um, the other panel on the right, this is the entire firm. So the data come from both the retail locations as well as the corporate headquarters locations. Because the corporate headquarters locations has a less clear sense of hierarchy, we're just going to rank people in terms of pay buckets. So if you see at the very bottom decile of pay, um, it's about 50-50 men and women. But if you move to the top decile of pay, it's only 20% women um, and then 80% men occupying those deciles. And this can happen for a variety of reasons, but in the paper we show that what happens is that women are less likely to be promoted. So there's a gender promotion gap, even after controlling for performance. And in fact, once you control for performance, so comparing people with the same performance, the gender promotion gap widens because women actually have higher performance on average. So let me tell you now about these nine box ratings. And so I'm going to start by showing you what the men's ratings are, the distribution of ratings for men. So what you can see here is that in terms of performance, the average man gets a performance rating of two, which is the middle rating. In terms of potential, it's actually very hard in our data set for people to get the highest potential. So it's not, we're not giving out high potential ratings to everyone. So most people get a potential rating of one, which is low potential. And then some people get a medium potential, and very few people get the top potential. Now the next panel I'm going to show is the relative share of women in these buckets. And so what we see in the performance level, if you look at two, uh, that's just right at 100%. So what that means is that there's basically the same number of women who get a performance rating of two relative to men. But when you look at one, you see that women are substantially less likely to get the lowest performance rating, and they're more likely to get the highest performance rating. But when you go and look at potential, you see the opposite pattern. So women are much more likely to get the lowest potential rating, they're less likely to get any of these higher potential ratings, so these twos or threes. And in fact, when you aggregate it together, um, when I remember I showed you this picture, the, um, this cell, these workhorses, so people who have the highest performance rating and the lowest potential rating, women are 50% more likely to be rated as workhorses in the firm. Okay. So why, why do women have these lower potential ratings? So one natural potential answer is that these ratings are accurate, and women actually just have lower potential. Maybe they perform well in their current jobs, but they don't actually have this um, potential to lead in the firm. And so we're going to try to assess that. And there's no strict definition of what potential is. But usually when you read the um, literature in terms of how to use these tools, what they'll say is potential should be defined as a measure of someone's ability to contribute to the firm in the future. And so you can either contribute by taking on additional responsibilities or doing a better job in your current role, or you can contribute by being promoted into a new role and taking on sort of managerial responsibility and greater leadership possibilities. So there's a lot of work um, suggesting that maybe women might have fewer opportunities or a lower desire to contribute in the future. 
So one possibility could be that women have lower career aspirations. They might anticipate greater discrimination. They might have greater household constraints that limit their desire or ability to take on promotions. You might sort of see leaning out or sort of like a lack of a desire to sort of steer away from the sort of corporate ladder. And so if the company is thinking that that's the case, they might correctly assess that women have lower potential. Um, you can also imagine that women, regardless of their aspirations, they might be more likely to interrupt their careers um, in response to family caregiving type issues. And those could be reasons why a firm might assess women as having lower potential. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at data on this, and we're going to see whether women indeed have lower potential. So whether they have lower potential because they have lower future performance at the firm, or if they have lower potential because they're more likely to leave um, in some way. Okay. And so we're going to show you in a variety of ways that that's actually not the case. So the first is to look at future potential. So we're going to compare um, men and women who have the same current potential ratings, the same they're rated the same, but we're going to look at their potential in the future. And the, com the paper does this in a variety of ways, but what I'm showing you here is what happens to men and women who are promoted. And what you see here is that women who are promoted actually end up having higher future performance than men who are promoted. And so one way to describe that, oftentimes we think about the discrimination literature as thinking about whether we apply different thresholds to men and women. So in particular, we're looking at the marginal woman. So what that basically means is that what this test is doing is trying to compare the woman who barely got promoted with the man who barely got promoted. Because if you look at people who barely get promoted, what you're identifying is the threshold, the bar that you have to meet in order to be promoted. And so what we see here is that when we find that women who are promoted on the margin, if they're doing better, that suggests that the bar for women was higher. So in order to be promoted, women had to reach a higher level of future performance to justify that promotion. So that when you look at the set of people who are promoted, these marginal women are better. So that's indicative of bias. The firm can actually do a better job for itself. It can promote better managers by promoting more women on the margin and fewer men and equalizing these two bars. Okay. Um, so one one potential, um, another aspect, is what I've shown you so far is that this is what happens if people stay at the firm. But another possibility is that the firm thinks, you know, women are just as likely to perform well in the future, and they might even perform better in the future, but there's a lot of risk in their careers, and maybe if I invest in someone today, they might leave the uh, job market later on, uh, leave the firm later on. So next what we're going to do is we're going to look at women's likelihood to leave the, um, to leave the firm. And so leaving aside the legality of kind of anticipating people's fertility decisions, for instance, and making kind of investments based on that, um, I want to think about whether these beliefs are actually justified by the data that we have. And um, it's, I'm not going to show you sort of all the tables for this, but what we find is that that's not the case. In fact, women have lower attrition, so women are more attached to their employer. They're less likely to leave the firm. And they're in particular less likely to leave when they're passed over for a promotion. So we look at these cases in which we have men who have um, top performance ratings and women who have top performance ratings. But then someone else is promoted, but they're not promoted. In those cases, men are very likely to leave the firm, but women are no more likely to leave the firm. And so one possible interpretation of this from the firm's perspective is great. These women are less likely to leave. We can invest in them more confidently because they're going to stay at the firm, so I should view this as a positive thing. But that's not actually what we observe. Instead, what happens is that firms uh, rate people based on their risk of loss. And so if you're likely to leave, the firm says, oh, this person might leave. I need to do something to retain them. And so when we look in the data, we look to see that people who are rated as at higher risk of loss, and that's disproportionately men, those people tend to get higher promotions in the future, higher bonuses in the future, um, higher wage sort of salary increases in the future. And so what seems to happen instead is that women's kind of either unwillingness or inability, because if you don't have, you know, maybe you can't move to a different city because of your family, um, that leaves, leads firms to direct more resources toward retaining men. And so that actually ends in the firm promoting worse workers, because what happens is you're promoting people who don't necessarily deserve the promotion. You're promoting them because you want to keep them. But because there's a finite no number of promotions, you're passing over a woman who would actually statistically in our data be more qualified to take that position. 
And then lastly, what we do is we think about, you know, what are some things we can do to maybe change this? And so one possibility is that maybe this is something about the way that the managers, so managers are giving these nine box ratings to their subordinates. So maybe we can do something to change the manager. Um, a lot of people ask about, well, do you know if the manager is female or not? Do women treat their female subordinates differently? And can assigning women to more female managers give them more effective mentors? Uh, it turns out the literature on this is very mixed. So there's cases in which women are more supportive of other women, but also cases in which women kind of compete more directly against each other. Another possibility is maybe we can just assign women to better managers. If the manager is doing a good job, they should be less biased, they should be better able to assess the quality of their workers. Or you can imagine maybe something like assigning women to younger managers, people who, have, who are more likely to have kind of more modern um, gender attitudes and stereotypes. And what we basically find is that all of these approaches are challenging. So assigning women to female managers. What we find is that female managers in our data, at least they do have a lower gap. So they're less likely to give men disproportionately higher potential ratings relative to their female subordinates. But women are just harsher. <laughs> so the ratings are just lower in general. So if you want, you don't know, you know it's, it's not clear what the trade-off is. Um, star managers, we actually find the opposite. So they give higher ratings to everyone, but they have a higher gap between men and women who are working under them. Or you can imagine maybe younger managers. And what we find is that there's no relationship by age. At any age, um, any age of manager, women get higher uh, performance ratings, lower potential ratings, and they're less likely to be promoted. And then lastly, um, what we can say is we can't change the manager. Maybe we can change something about these ratings themselves. So I've sort of shown some evidence that these ratings are biased. And maybe we don't want to use bias ratings in our promotion decisions. So one possibility is I just stop using potential ratings altogether in my promotion decisions. Another possibility is that maybe I can just try to change these potential ratings a little bit. I can kind of like um, just move, uh, readjust the ratings to be more gender equitable, to debias them in some way. So we don't observe the firm doing this, but we can run some simulations to see what would happen. And so when we run these simulations, we're going to focus on a couple things. So one, what would that do to gender differences in promotion rates? And what would it do to the quality of the managers that we end up actually choosing to promote? So in the first, um, in the first counterfactual exercise, um, if you can see in the, uh, the left-hand panel, there's, um, there's two horizontal lines. So that blue line there, that is the, in the baseline case, so in our original case, the promotion rates of men. And the red line is the promotion rates of women. So in the baseline, you see this gap in promotion rates that's represented by the distance between these two lines. If we throw away the potential information, the potential information that was biased against women, you see that the woman's um, promotion rate, the red bar, that moves up above the red line. So we've increasing the promotion rates of women, and we're also decreasing the promotion rates of men. So this policy is going to be more equitable in terms of equalizing promotion rates. But then if you look at the next panel over there, what that's graphing now is the estimates of the quality of the managers that get promoted. So that horizontal line is the quality of managers being promoted in the baseline case. And what happens is that when we do this, when we throw away that potential information, we're being more equitable, but we're also not doing as good a job at identifying good managers. And this is the Peter principle coming back. What this means is that potential ratings, they're biased, but they also contain useful information about people's people's uh, ability to lead in the future. So if you throw away the uh, potential rating, you're throwing away the bias, but you're also throwing away a lot of that information. So our second counterfactual, the way the second counterfactual works is very simple. We just basically say, if a woman gets a performance rating of three, we're just gonna bump up her potential rating. So we're getting rid of this kind of female workhorse label. And so in practice, that might be challenging to implement because people know that you're gonna bump it up so they might scale it down. But this is just a demonstration of the of the possibilities that can be achieved if we're able to sort of debias these ratings. So when we do that, what we find is that women's potential, women's promotion rates goes up by a lot because we're sort of bumping them up in these potential scores and moving them into these higher categories. Um, at the same time, though, you see that the quality has actually increased. And so we're preserving some of the ranking information in the potential score, but we're getting rid of some of the biases in it. And uh, that allows the firm to both be more equitable in its promotion decisions and also end up with a better class of managers that they're choosing. Okay. And so, um, so lastly, uh, I just want to sort of conclude. 
Uh, what we've shown is that these subjective assessments of potential, either made formally through things like nine box evaluations or just kind of made in our minds in the sense that we always kind of engage in potential evaluation, that contributes to the gender gaps in promotion and in pay. It seems as though women have a, sorry, managers have a hard time imagining women as leaders, relatively speaking. And this is true, and I didn't show this, even after um, women have demonstrated their, their performance. So one thing that I didn't talk about was um, even after a woman's been promoted and has outperformed men after the promotion, we can look at her future performance, future potential ratings going forward, and those continue to be lower. So people aren't updating very well. And so then um, we, can't get, we can't really get rid of potential ratings because we're throwing away too much information. So I think a lot of what we should think about moving forward is thinking about are there ways for us to sort of de-bias our assessments of potential. And so these could be sort of actions related to reducing kind of unconscious forms of stereotype bias. One of the things that happens um, in the US setting, or at least in this company setting, is that there's no <laughs> formal definition of what potential is. And you can just give someone a number. You know, I can just say two or I can say three, and I don't have to justify it at all. So maybe having a system in which we actually force people to write down, this is the definition of potential, this is why I gave this person this rating, and this is the evidence or this is the logic behind my thinking. And that might discipline people's thoughts. Um, we should also think about how firms can reduce strategic mistakes. So this desire to just act. So if someone's going to leave, I'm going to have to go do something to keep them. <coughs> because what that's doing is that's distorting the firm's resources, and they're ending up promoting more men who are actually don't end up being better managers. Or we can think about kind of other types of tools or algorithms or other kinds of um, ways for us to evaluate potential and a way to give us sort of better information about how to make these decisions. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, um, I have a lot of questions for you, but I will save them for the okay. panel. And before we bring the whole panel up, I would like to invite uh, Louis-Pierre Lepage up on the stage, and uh, who is a researcher at uh, SOFIE, the Swedish Institute for... Um, Social research. social research at the universe at Stockholm University, and you're specializing in labor <laughs> economics and economics of discrimination. And I also think you are really the personal. Um, we have to thank you personally <coughs> for having Daniel Lee here in Stockholm, and you will give some perspective from a research point of view, and also maybe contextualize it a bit for, from a Swedish perspective. So very welcome. Yes. First of all, uh, hi everyone. Thanks a lot for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here today. And I'll take a couple of minutes just to highlight some of what I think are the key takeaways that we've kind of learned from this research. And the first is to note that employers fundamentally need to evaluate their workers. Right? That could be when deciding who to hire, who to dismiss, who to promote, and so on. And in doing so, they may partly want to base themselves on past performance and existing qualifications. Those might help me predict what would happen in the future. But often there's a lot of remaining uncertainty there because jobs, people, and workplaces can change over time. And it's really hard to know how someone would perform in a position until they're actually put in a position. Right? Then the question is, then how should we design evaluation systems or evaluation procedures to evaluate workers? Right? And we have sometimes objective metrics, like performance indicators and other quantifiable things that we can use. But often those are not enough. Because a lot of the time to complete the picture, we want to bring in evaluations from other people, like supervisors and coworkers and so on, that might have information also about the performance of the person, maybe more soft skills or something that's hard to observe. And we want to bring those in as well. But then that introduces discretion and subjectivity in the process, which leaves room for potential mistakes and biases to come in. And so I think this highlights the kind of complicated but crucial balancing act that employers need to do. And that is true at the firm that we've seen in the US, but this is something that should be very true as well in the Swedish context. Another thing that I want to mention is <coughs> how you implement the evaluation procedure itself can have consequences on how workers will behave and potentially unanticipated consequences as well. So how you actually implement and utilize the system also matters. If women are disadvantaged at the promotion stage, then it is even possible that that could deter them from trying to be promoted in the first place, reinforcing the issue and feeding into things like gender norms and stereotypes or role congru congruity, as it was brought up. Right? And it could also have unanticipated consequences. The result that men were much more likely to leave the organization altogether if they were passed up while women were staying, and then leading to this firm kind of thinking that they have this trade-off between 
promotion decisions and turnover decisions, which can lead to these strategic mistakes that were referred to. Okay. In the Swedish context, more generally, Sweden is often regarded as a front runner on gender uh, equality. That being said, we still have this evidence that the higher up you go in the firm's organization, the more there are promotion gaps and kind of differences in representation. Um, there's also been in Sweden over time increases in individual contracts, individual wage setting, as well as growth into complex and service sector jobs. And those tend to be positions where it's hard to evaluate a worker objectively and where the types of issues that were brought up in this study might be very relevant. Ultimately though, I think we simply need more research to see how it would transfer to a different work environment, different work culture, different society, but also more research on uh, thinking about specific solutions that we can design to kind of overcome these challenges. This leads me to my last point that uh, the research we saw was rare evidence that comes from within an employer. So what actually goes on within an organization? And there's a lot of questions that are key for the labor market that kind of require researchers to have access to these data to answer, and that are very hard to answer using even the great administrative register data that's available for Sweden. Right? I think it highlights the room that there can be very successful collaborations between researchers and organizations on key questions like recruitment, human resources, operations management. And those could be mutually beneficial because they're questions that researchers like us are fundamentally interested in, but they're also questions that organizations should want answers to. Right. I'll finish there and I'll say I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Louis Pierre, and a hand for him. And uh, please uh, stay on stage oh, and uh, Daniel, Peter and Magnus, please uh, come up and I will now introduce our third and fourth panelists. Magnus Tegborg is uh, CEO and founding partner at Alumni an international consultancy firm <coughs> working with executive search, recruitment, as well as assessment and development of executives, managers, specialists, and board members. So wow. right <laughs> into this uh, issue. And Peter Tai Christensen is a team manager at the policy section of Unionen, Sweden's largest trade union on the private labor market, and according to your website, the largest white-collar trade union in the world. You have 685 members working in uh, 88,000 different uh, organizations and, and firms. And Peter, you have 20 years of uh, experience of working with gender equality, so very welcome to both of you as well. And I would like to, to start by inviting uh, Magnus and uh, Peter to have a first comment. Magnus, since you work w on a daily basis with assessing uh, people for, on your, for your clients um, uh, well, as a service, uh, what are your initial impressions of this, of this study and do you recognize this and how do you work with a sort of avoiding gender bias? Yes, of course, it, it's a bit depressing as a start to see that this actually happens. And, and even though you could argue this, this was a while ago, it's the US and it's a special industry that we see this in, I think, unfortunately, it, it is probably true that this is, is the case. Uh, you, I'm not a researcher, but I, you can see it in organizations, even though I think in, in Sweden there is a context of, of us overcoming this uh, in, in many ways. Maybe we wouldn't look at exactly the same if we look at a Swedish context, but I, I do believe that it's unfortunately probably true. And, and to m all of the, many of the reasons that that was also brought up here. Um, uh, what, so what are we doing about it? Uh, what, what can we do about it? I mean, there, there are several things. I think one, one, re one thing you can do about it is try to get rid of these biases, the un unconscious biases that's actually there. It's, it's, the, it's the most difficult ones to get rid of, but at least you can try to get rid of them. To understand that you walk into situ an interview situation, it's actually a very poor situation in many ways to evaluate someone, even though that's what we mostly use, because actually you, you walk into that situation extremely biased um, with all kinds of ideas of how a person is and should be. And, and then you start talking, and then you, you realize that this person has the same interest in you, and all of a sudden you rate the person higher. So it's all kinds of these biases are, are kind of there. So the more you try to get the bi those biases out of that interview situation, the better it is. <coughs> Uh, of course, by, by knowing, understanding them. So we try to train our people, for instance, in, in just knowing about their own unconscious biases when they walk in. You can, of course, use test tools and all kinds of instruments to also, to some degree, to get rid of that, even though it's, it's not complete uh, scientific science around the, the, to that, that that will predict the future either, but at least it gives you a fairly objective uh, picture of, of a person. You can use that as a combination. 
um, as well. So, so, hope, so getting as many different angles into the, how you value it is probably the best way to overcome this. But you, it's difficult to get away from this bias. Thank you, Magnus. And uh, Peter, from, from, the point of, from your point of view and also uh, Nune, it would be interesting to, to, if you have something to say about the gender gap uh, in promotion and pay um, in your member base, and also what kind of advice you give to employers when it comes to gender inequality. Please. Yes. Uh, first of all, let me just uh, say that unfortunately this doesn't really come as a surprise, but these results don't come as a, as a surprise to us. Uh, but that doesn't make the study any less important. I think it is very important and I also think that um, although we m might not be able to use the exact numbers from the study in Sweden or apply them to the Swedish context, I think we see the same patterns here in Sweden. Uh, and of course one of the main takeaways uh, would be that there is a gender bias and that's a problem that needs to be addressed, analyzed and uh, we need to uh, also promote change. Um, I think uh, it's also important to stress that what we seek isn't gender neutrality, it's gender equality by means of gender equity. So I th it's not enough to remove the bias, we need to do more, we need to make sure that the outcome uh, is equal between uh, women and men. So that's one of the most important uh, points of departure for us as a trade union. Uh, what we do, well, um, we do get some uh, <coughs> cases regarding gender discrimination and we also get a lot of questions. We, we have a hotline and we get around one call a day uh, regarding gender equality or gender discrimination issues, but it is important to stress that um, a lot of the issues are being handled and hopefully also solved at the local or regional level and we don't have any uh, statistics on that level. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, on the company level I think a lot of problems are actually being handled in a satisfactory way, that's at least what I hope. Uh, but we do of course give advice, guidance and we also have trainings, uh, guidelines uh, for our shop stewards, our elected representatives to make sure that they can be um, active and try to make sure that all companies, all employers also comply with the provisions on uh, active measures that are uh, part of the Swedish Discrimination Act, which is supposed to promote equal opportunities for women and men. So that's the main tool. But we also want to be able to, to have these regulations in our co collective bargaining agreements because we think that the social partners in Sweden have the best uh, opportunities, the best uh, preconditions to make sure that we actually achieve gender equality in the workplaces as well. Uh, so that's one of our main focuses. Thank you. And I would like to open up the floor for, for questions and comments and uh, then I will fill in. But please, if you have any questions or would like to comment, uh, just raise your hand and wait for a microphone and uh, say who you are and where you come from. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carl Shander and uh, I'm the founder of Exporang. Uh, we do actually uh, unbiased recruitment matching technology. I find this very interesting and, and the research is, is fascinating. Uh, as you said, maybe not so surprising, but nevertheless, uh, it was such a clear dissection of the problem and uh, also some solutions that you presented there that are highly interesting. My question is, uh, this huge organization that you built the research on, how did they react when the final research was there and presented to them? Um, so I am under a very strict NDA uh, with regard to the, we don't uh, know the data is. provider. <laughs> well, um, so I mean, in some sense it's interesting because there are, because the firm o ha um, has so many employees, there's a very finite number of companies that it could be. And so when we, um, when the paper, someone tweeted out the paper, we actually the next day got emails from multiple representatives of these potential companies. So obviously it came from one of them, not all of them, um, but many of them wrote and said, hey, is this us? <laughs> um, and so I think that that says that not just our data provider, but potentially the other firms that are kind of in this recognize something of themselves in that. Um, but for NDA reasons, I can't really talk more okay. about what their plans are. Have, have you thought about taking it uh, one step further in, in kind of measuring what the um, economic outcome would have been if one had promoted the right people, kind of, um, <laughs> i.e. more women, into these roles? And 
is it possible to do that uh, scientifically, or would that just be a hypothetical exercise? That um, so we can do some. So the paper does certain things related to that about sort of what would the quality of the managers be had we promoted more. But yeah. then it's a bit hard to sort of tie that to um, to revenue outcomes. What would actually be better, um, and this is an open invitation, is for a company to be willing to experiment and um, you know, implement a new process or to promote more women on the margin, and then we can actually track and measure how the company does in the future and actually get better data on this. And so I think um, I would just uh, take this as a moment where um, sort of uh, academic and industry collaboration can sort of reveal a lot of useful information and it's free consulting as well. And I would really like to stress this point that, that researchers, I mean, Louis Pierre and his colleagues at, at Sophie and, and also now Daniel are really interested in, in doing this kind of collaboration. So if you have data and you're willing to sort of open up under strict NDAs, or, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, please uh, contact us or, or the researcher afterwards. But I would like to, to hang on to, to Carl's questions. Maybe more generally, what, what sort of response have you gotten when you present your these findings to, to employers and firms and <laughs> also maybe in academia again? I think, um, I think people are individually upset and then collectively there becomes this quite, I think you can be rhetorically upset while not acting. <laughs> I recognize that as well. So, Daniel, do we have any questions from our online audience? I think you're just talking to it. Yes, uh, we have. Uh, we got one question from Maria Carmen Torgo Perez at uh, Chalmers. Um, and the question is the same way there seems to be, and it's uh, the question is to Daniel. Uh, the same way there seems to be a bias against uh, women receiving high potential ratings despite having on average higher performance ratings. Are there also biases in the performance ratings, i.e. gender bias also in assessing past performance or do you conclude there are no or less bias because it's a more quantitative measure? Yeah, that's a really good question because right now um, the only measures of performance that we have are the ratings themselves. So it's actually hard to know whether or not um, these ratings are um, unbiased, they're biased against women, or maybe even biased uh, in favor of women. So there's, um, there's been some other research sort of suggesting that even when there are observed measures of performance, they're still sort of subject to um, interpretation. And in many cases, even the performance measures for which we actually have data can um, leave, leave sort of space for there to be biased typically against women. What we do in our setting is that there's another set of workers at the company who are not under the nine box rankings, um, but they're sort of sales workers where you have a better measure of people's actual output. And for the sales role, we find that women also have higher performance based on observed measures of their sales. Um, but it's a good question about the um, bias in the performance ratings. It's hard to tell in our setting. So if we dig in a bit uh, in the different findings uh, from the, the study, uh, and this is a question to anybody who wants to answer from the panel, um, the, uh, you're finding that, uh, that these potential ratings d do not seem to be self-correcting. I mean, even after women perform well over and <coughs> over again, the potential is still measures that lower. What do you think, why is that? Maybe Magnus or <laughs> Peter wants to. I think we have these biases, and, and, and they're there. I think, that, I mean, one good thing with this research and, and we should that it sh this should be spread and, and people should know about it and we probably should get out into the HR leader communities that so they actually walk into these but by knowing that these biases are there maybe just by highlighting it and putting the light on it you might think okay I, I, maybe I'm thinking a bit wrong here now maybe I'm actually am, am rating women lower or not so, so just by actually highlighting that this is probably bias that we all have as it seems not only men or women it's everyone has it Maybe that's that's a way to just show, uh, and there could be others like this, uh, the same. So, so if, if we highlight that this is an issue for everyone doing these ratings, so when you do this nine grid, for instance, you know that before you do it, you should always have an instruction to look beyond what you normally think about when you set potential. So there's some kind of measurement around what actually what is potential, which is one. It's mm. a good question in itself. Peter. I think it has a lot to do with what you mentioned, Danielle, imagination, stereotypes. Uh, and I also think it's important to, to maybe uh, sort of look into the possibility. Is there any way that you could look at 
uh, key performance indicators of what people already do in their current role and is that a more precise prediction on how they will perform in a different role in the future because uh, it seems that the bias is stronger when it's about potential than actually actual performance. So I think one way to improve the system could be to find these uh, key performance indicators and look at them instead because that doesn't leave as much space for the wild and gender stereotypical imaginations of people who, who do these potential ratings. Do you want to comment? Oh, and I was going to say, so I mean, one sort of particularly depressing aspect of that, that finding is that it's a nine box rating, which means uh, the potential component and the performance component are determined in the same meeting. Mm -hmm. So in the same meeting in which you're looking back and giving a woman a high performance review relative to what you gave her before potential wise, in that literal same meeting, you're also giving her a lower potential rating going forward. So this isn't sort of separated by a few months where you've forgotten, it's the same meeting. <laughs> Um, the other thing I think is, is useful is that maybe another thing that firms can do is that you can build in more opportunities to showcase your potential in your current role. Mm -hmm. So not just to do the same thing over again in a way that makes it difficult to infer, but if we can give people opportunities to sort of stretch or to engage in sort of manage your actions so that you then have more concrete evidence. Uh, and I think that could probably make it a little bit easier. Thank you. So we have one question over there. Thank you. My name is Emma Henriksen. I'm well chair in different organizations and usually working with high, with welfare and, and healthcare. Uh, my question is: uh, This is about gender, uh, but if you add on uh, disabilities or people of color and and other things that we know can be in disadvantage, uh, have you studied that at all? Can you see if the, that that um, the bias gets even worse uh, if there's Anything else added? Yeah, so um, this is sort of relates earlier to the question about how much we should trust the performance ratings themselves. So in our data, we have information on um, race and ethnicity, not on disability status. Um, and when we look at that, we often find that it goes in the same direction. So the potential ratings tend to be lower and performance ratings tend to be lower. The, the gender category for females are the, it's the only category in which one group is getting higher performance ratings and lower potential ratings. Um, but the fact, for instance, that minority um, workers tend to get lower potential ratings as well as lower performance ratings, it's a little bit hard to interpret because we, don't, again, don't know whether the performance ratings are indicative of truly lower performance or if there's sort of bias reflected in that itself. Um, so we highlighted the sort of the gender aspect because this is where we're seeing both sort of a theoretical foundation for why we might think that women might sort of be hurt in terms of potential ratings, as well as just very stark difference between sort of the, the positive um, performance combined with the negative potential. So uh, with the risk of falling into blame the uh, victim trap, I would like to, to bring up the issue of women in this study, in your findings, because they really don't seem to well, uh, do a good job at uh, promoting others. I mean, the, the women, ma female managers uh, give their subordinates uh, less uh, potential ratings, less performance, uh, less pay and everything. They stay even if they are not promoted. I mean, uh, what's wrong with, <laughs> with women? Uh, do you have any, any comments to those findings? I guess on the staying when not promoting, you can see a lot of reasons why maybe there would be gender disparities in that as well. Um, first of all, if the other firms also have a promotion gap towards women, well, it's not clear that women moving to other organizations could get promoted. While if men are favored in promotion at every firm, then if they get passed over once, they can go to the other one and then they, maybe they can get uh, hope for promotion. Uh, there's also quite a bit of evidence that uh, women sometimes are less mobile in their search radius and to how far they can go out to work because of family reasons. And maybe it's less easy to move the family around when it's uh, the woman that has an opportunity versus the men. So there's a couple of reasons to expect that maybe moving is a riskier mm -hmm. option or a harder option for a woman. Magnus, would you like to comment? It's, it's, it's a bit depressing, actually, that, that that's the case. I would, when I saw that first, I thought, well, the, the solution is, of course, around the corner because we see more women coming through having managerial roles. Even though it takes time on, this, on the very high-ranking CEO roles, we still have very <coughs> minority of women, but still, we, you can see it happening uh, if we look uh, a bit down in the organization. But it seems that it's depressing enough that women don't uh, help each other anyway. So we have to get around that, of course, and uh, with, with getting those biases out of the way there as well. I, I, I don't have an answer to why that is the case. That was actually the most surprising thing 
in this uh, study, why that, why that actually happens. So I actually just want to put a sort of a, a clarification point on that. So in our data, we're looking at, um, you know, workers who are matched to female managers. That match doesn't happen randomly. So one possibility is that um, if you're sort of the most ambitious, sort of the best workers in the firm, you go after, you want to have a male manager. So it could be possible that the fact that female, so that the subordinates of female managers having lower ratings, it could be that like, they were assigned to lower quality workers to begin with. So it's a little bit hard to sort of make that. Um, interpretation. Peter, do you give uh, career advice to your, I mean, to your members generally and maybe to your female members especially on how to sort of, uh, well, negotiate your way up the career ladder? Well, also I should say that we actually organize female ma or managers uh, as well and also, of course, both male and female managers. Uh, and about your question before, I think sometimes we need to recognize that uh, female managers are at a risk of being reduced to actually being females. And when we analyze their behavior, we sort of have different expectations for them because they are female. But of course, uh, if they have been uh, like adopting or adapting to a male biased culture, of course, they feel they need to comply to that in, in some, to some extent. Uh, because if they do uh, break the patterns, it might be seen as a feminist act. And of course, that's uh, something that a woman might not be might not want to be reduced to as a manager, so they might comply to the same rules as rules as everybody else in the workplace. So that might be one explanation. Uh, what we encourage to get onto that part of the question is to have talent management programs, leadership programs, because that's at least a way to see uh, how this potential could be realized. Although you might not have the opportunity to, to carry out these work tasks right now, of course there's a better way to, to precisely predict how you could perform in a, in a new role in the future. So, so these management and leadership programs are, are key to succeeding, I think. Thank you. We have a question from the audience here. Um, my name is Susie Kvart and, uh, um, well, I, I've had a qu quite, quite a long work life, so I, I base my, my, my question or, or my comment on that. Um, your results are very depressing and they confirm what I've seen all my work life. But uh, what I wonder is, um, when your managers or, 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 or your companies are, well, when you draw their attention to, to their uh, unconscious bias, uh, are there any indications that they want to change their unconscious bias? Because that, I think, is the one of the main problems. That, because, well, that they find them fairly um, um, well. It's 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 they find it nothing wrong with having such biases, and they want to recruit my people because. Um, well, it's better. <laughs> Thank you. I would like maybe to direct this question to Magnus, who who works a lot with the employers. Yes, uh, I've uh, complex question, of course, but I, I think you're you're uh, you're right. It, it's probably you, you also you want to have a if have a workforce where you feel that you are are similar and and it it works out well with before. Let's do it again. Uh, so so that's of course th then you reinstate what's already been there. But I'm, I'll take an optimistic view here. But I think actually over time what we are seeing is more and more. Uh, really good examples and showing good examples of women leaders, female leaders, uh, other types of leaders, let's say that, who comes up through the ranks. And that's, that's shown as examples. They can be good mentors. You can have training from them shown. And I think if you show the more examples that, that leadership uh, is not a male uh, kind of trait, it's actually something that everyone can do. And there's actually, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's just a general trait. Uh, and you have to have good examples. So then all of a sudden, I think these biases over time maybe can change, even though it probably takes some time. So if you can get more of those examples, you might not end up where, where you said, uh, because you actually see, oh, there's, there's, a, there's really good examples of these female leaders who do ex extremely well, both r the results, but also how they lead organizations and the ratings of, of employee satisfaction and so on. I would like to ask the panel, uh, because you, in, the, in the conclusions of your paper you bring out the algorithm, and, and, and I would like to, to, to hear from you, what do you think the potential is for, for sort of using uh, new technology in order to, to um, get rid of biases? Um. Um, I can take that. Mm -hmm. So I think, 
Uh, so algorithms are increasingly used, um, especially in the hiring process. And there's been a lot of controversy around the use of algorithms and lots of cases sort of documenting situations in which the algorithms themselves encode bias. And so one kind of famous example was Amazon was um, built this resume reviewer, and the resume reviewer was trained on their historical data, which presumably had a lot of men in it. And so it learned to sort of figure out if you row women's crew versus if you row men's crew. And if you row women's crew, it's worse because you know, you're a woman, and that's negatively related. To, um, to outcomes. And so I think one needs to be really careful about sort of how we use algorithms, um, but I think they're promising for two reasons. So the first is that oftentimes we think about the benchmark of you shouldn't adopt an algorithm because it's biased, and the benchmark is relative to no bias. But the correct benchmark is relative to what we're currently doing. And humans can be extraordinarily biased. And one major difference between algorithms and humans is that you can tell an algorithm to change by coding it differently. Telling a person to change is much <laughs> harder, actually. <laughs> um, and so some of the research I've done um, on algorithms uh, thinks about different ways to design algorithms. So most algorithms that are used in the hiring process right now um, rely on something that's sort of related to sort of supervised learning. So what that means is I have a historical data set that has sort of people that I think did well and some characteristics, and I'm trying to build a model that, um, from that historical data set and apply it to looking at people in the future. And obviously, if my historical data set is very, you know, you know, full of certain groups of people, then my vision of the future becomes sort of tied to the past. But that doesn't, that's not how algorithms fundamentally function. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you think about the way that um, cars are taught to drive themselves, um, they're taught using a different set of algorithms known as reinforcement learning, where the idea is you try to encounter new situations to learn how you might behave in these situations. So instead of using sort of algorithms that are purely based on supervised learning, you can think about algorithms that say, sometimes I want to do what's best based on the data I currently have, but sometimes I want to explore and I want to learn about what would it be like to select this person that I don't have that much information about. Because one, this person might turn out great, and even if they don't turn out great, I have better information to make future predictions. So building in aspects of exploration in the algorithms and otherwise on of taking advantage of the fact that we can code algorithms and get them to behave differently, I think is promising. And I think that this technologically optimistic uh, <laughs> remark will be <laughs> our concluding <laughs> remark for today. Thank you very much, Daniel, Louis-Pierre, Magnus, and Peter, and of course yeah. all of you as well. We'll let's give our um, panel an applaud. Uh, Innan jag släpper iväg er så har jag två tips. Det första är ett sådant här samhällsprogram där vi fortfarande har någon enstaka plats till höstens omgång. Det är en utbildning för alla som vill fördjupa sina kunskaper i ja, hur Sverige och EU styrs och hur politik och förvaltning går till både då på lokal, nationell och EU-nivå. Eh, och sen så har vi ett jättespännande seminarium nästa vecka om, på ett helt annat tema, nämligen antibiotikaresistens. Men jag tänkte ändå passa på att tipsa om det idag för att det här är en väldigt viktig fråga också utöver jämställdhet. Det är den 8 juni och vi har bland annat Pfizer's eh, Sverige vd och även Sveriges ambassadör i kampen mot antibiotikaresistens. Så att varmt välkomna då och eh, med de orden så vill jag önska er alla en trevlig helg. <laughs>